дорогие товарищи, дамы и господа, ladies and gentlemen, comrades, I guess, and good afternoon to all of you. Before I begin, I would like to apologize for such a long break between lectures. We've had some issues, but I promise to be a good boy in the future. I promise to be much better. So today we'll be talking about one of the most, one of the harshest experiences of World War II. We will be talking about the blockade of Lenin. So introduction. Uh, in my previous two lectures, I've mentioned Operation Barbarossa very heavily. Operation Barbarossa was the German plan for leading the Soviet Union and conquering it. Now, why is Operation Barbarossa important here? The reason is because Leningrad was one of the German objectives. Over here to the right, you can see a map of Operation Barbarossa. So, there were three army groups that the Germans had at the beginning of the campaign. They were Army Group North, Army Group Center, and Army Group South. Army Group North's objective was Leningrad. Our, uh, Army Group Center objective was Moscow. And Army Group South objective was Stalingrad. The question is, why is Leningrad so important? Why was it important to the Germans? Moscow is the capital. Maybe you take the capital and you calm down. No. Leningrad was very important to the Germans because this was the city where the Russian Revolution started, or as they called it, the Bolshevik Revolution. This city was the birthplace of the Soviet Union, as it was for 70 years, and they wanted to eradicate it. That was one of the things that Hitler said. We have to eradicate the city from the surface of the earth completely, just like Moscow. Leningrad was similar to Stalingrad because it bared the name of one of the leaders of the revolution. Stalingrad bearing the name of Stalin, and Leningrad bearing the name of Lenin, the father of the Soviet Union. So, Leningrad was a very big city. It was the second biggest city of the Soviet Union. In 1941, it had around 3 million people living in it. And it was also a very big center for production. A lot of tanks, a lot of tractors, a lot of food was produced there. Leningrad was also a very big port. So anyone who could, who could control Leningrad was a very rich and a very lucky person. Now, to some of the people who maybe don't know uh, Leningrad, Leningrad is not called Leningrad anymore. It's called St. Petersburg, just like it was called when it was first created during the times of the Russian Empire. Now, Leningrad held on for almost 900 days, 872 days to be exact. During this time, one and a half million people died. 97% of the people who died died of hunger. 3% died because of the German artillery bombardments, which happened every day. And on the left is something that I wanted to show you. It is a map of all the hero cities of the former Soviet Union. A hero city is a title given to a city which saw very intense combat during World War II. Moscow was a hero city because this, the Battle of Moscow was a very big battle. Kiev is a hero city because there, there was at least three battles for Kiev during World War II. And Leningrad is one of them, too. And, yeah, it completely deserves, it, deserves its settling. So, a lot of people have been thinking that when we say German invasion of the Soviet Union, it's primarily the Germans. No. There were not only Germans. There were Italians. There were people from, the, from Yugoslavia. There were people who came from America to fight for the Nazis. And there were people from Spain who came to fight. And we will be talking about the Division Azul. The Division Azul translates to the Blue Division. The Blue Division was, they were Spanish soldiers who came from Spain. Spain was ruled by Franco, who was the Spanish fascist dictator at the time. And their objective was to help the Nazis take Leningrad. They were a very 
powerful unit, specifically because what, whenever you look at the chip, after themselves they left nothing. They burned everything, they killed everybody, they pillaged everything. That was the Luda vision. Above, this is a picture of some of the soldiers of this Division Azul. Now, as I already said, the Division Azul was there to try to take Leningrad, but there was also Italian ships. Again, a lot of people say that Italy didn't do much during World War II. That's true. The land forces of Italy were very small. They didn't have a lot of tanks, they didn't have a lot of airplanes, but the Italian Navy was one of the best navies of the whole world. And they sent ships to blockade Leningrad from the sea. Now, of course, the Germans were the main force. There was more Germans than anyone else. Just, we have to say that they weren't the only ones. They're not the only ones who are guilty of what happened under Leningrad. So, below is an image of German tanks next to Leningrad. That picture is approximately from 1942. So, when the situation got better, but still was bad. Because there, there's not a lot of images of German tanks in 1941 from the Soviet side of things, because the Soviet soldiers did not have enough, they did not have enough cameras. On the other hand, every German soldier had a camera. It was a 7mm Erika camera, produced in Switzerland. Not in Germany, but in Switzerland. The German army bought specifically cameras from Switzerland so that the soldiers could record what happened to them in combat and send it back to Germany so they could show it in their propaganda films. So, yes. Oh, most importantly, uh, to talk about this, I'll have to go a little bit back in history. In 1940, there was this war called the Soviet-Finnish Soviet War, if I'm correct. It was a war between the Soviet Union and Finland. Now, in that war, people still argue who was the winner because the Soviet Union did not completely take Finland, but Finland lost territory to the Soviet Union. Now, that's not as important right now because what is important is that Finland helped the Germans invade the Soviet Union and one of their objectives was Leningrad. And the Finnish too wanted to take Leningrad and destroy it. Which is interesting, because after the war, Finland always tried to say, we did nothing wrong, we were at the side, we, 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 we were good people, we did not do anything. That's not true. Finland did crimes too, and they did their crimes against the Soviet people. The former Soviet people. Now, so, as I said already, the importance of Stalingrad was an infrastructure, a lot of big, you know, you can produce tanks, you can produce tractors, and because it bared the name of Lenin. So, Leningrad was going, was going to see a lot of combat in the next few months. First phase of the battle. The first phase of the battle began on the 22nd of June, 1941, when the German, when the Nazi forces invaded the Soviet Union. Sorry. So, Already, in the first weeks of combat, the German tanks had advanced very, very close into some of the Soviet republics, into the Baltic states, so Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia. And Leningrad was not very far away from them. So, there was concern. What if the Germans take Leningrad almost, you know, just right at the beginning? That would be very bad. We can't lose such an important city. So the Soviet command ordered the construction of a defensive line called the Vushke Abranitne Kriplin, the defensive fortifications of Luka. They were built by the people of Leningrad. There was a special, there was a special rule, a special law placed into Leningrad that every every male worker, well, and females, if you, if you could, there were female, there was a lot of female volunteers. If you could, please come and help construct this defensive line to protect your city. The people of Leningrad did just that. Thanks to their efforts, the German army was halted very soon. They stopped on the 12th of July. That was their 
it, they got to the defensive line and they were stopped. What is interesting is that when they got to the defensive line, there wasn't any Soviet soldiers there at that moment. The army units sent there were still in transit, so they were stopped by the same citizens of Leningrad who helped build this defensive barrier. And they didn't have a lot of weapons. They didn't have any anti-tank weapons. And it's interesting because the German army hailed the best army of the world and the true conqueror of every single continent of the world was stopped by a group of people who were armed very badly. So, above is a map. It's in Russian because there's not a lot of uh, English maps, at least in the English language, about the siege of Leningrad because Leningrad was in the Soviet Union and not in Britain or not in the US. So here is shown the situation in September of 1941. So as you can see from above, the Finnish forces are advancing from one side, and from the other side, the German forces are trying to advance. Now, another thing that I want to talk about here is when we talk about World War II, we almost always say the Germans had the best technology. They had the best tanks, they had the best ships, the best, you, you name it, the best submarines. But that's not true. In 1941, we, the Soviet Union, developed tanks that were impenetrable by German cannons or anything that the Germans could use. Those were the T-34, the KV-1, and the KV-2 tanks. Now, the latter two, the KV-1 and the KV-2, saw very heavy action around Leningrad, because in Leningrad were the factories that produced them. So every day, I believe 20 tanks, 20 KV-1 and KV-2 tanks would be produced and be sent to the front line to stop the Germans. And before the Soviet Union, the Germans did not see any tanks that could match their own. And to be fair, their tanks are actually pretty bad. They're pretty outdated before 1941. So when they got into action against the KV-1s and the KV-2s, they were terrified. Nothing could stop them. Absolutely nothing. They had to call in, I believe on one occasion, they called in all of the aviation of Army Group North to destroy two KV-1 tanks that had managed to break through the front lines. And of course they were both destroyed, but the effect, can you believe it? An army is calling in all the aviation, that's approximately 1,000 aircrafts, to destroy two <coughs> tanks. That's, that's very strong. <laughs> and, uh, oh yes, I forgot to say that the tanks were used during the second phase of Phase one of the battle, when the Germans decided to advance again. Uh, these tanks helped stop them. At one point, one Soviet tank stopped an entire German tank division for three days and three nights. They didn't have any weapon, well, they didn't have any machine gun bullets. They only had the tank rounds, and they just stood there. They didn't move. They were just blocking the only bridge which let the Germans cross the river. And when the Germans tried to build a bridge maybe somewhere farther to the right or left of the tank, the tank would destroy it. So, how did the, in the end, the tank was destroyed and everyone who was in the tank was killed. But that happened only when the tank went run out of ammo and when the Germans finally got together a special group of special soldiers, well, a special force soldiers to put, I believe, 15 grenades under the tank and to detonate them at the same time. Only then the tank was destroyed. And uh, when the tank was finally destroyed, the Germans took this tank and, played, and they took it to Germany. But they didn't study it because when the German scientists saw this tank, they went, we have absolutely nothing to put up against this tank, and we can't copy it. It's impossible. It's made of materials. We will never have it in possession. But there was another battle, which I will talk about later. I will talk about it in the end, where one Soviet KV-1 tank destroyed 22 German tanks in half an hour. 
during one battle. I will talk about that later, but that was another goal. So that's to that's a counter argument to everyone who says that the Soviet tanks were not as technologically advanced as the German tanks. Yes. Now, for this presentation, I decided to include more images because the siege of Leningrad is it was 872 days long. That's almost two and a half years, I believe. So it's impossible to write out everything. It's impossible to place the text. There's, there's so many places where you can place the accent on, where you can place the emphasis. There's just too much to study. So the first winter of the siege was the winter of 1941, 1942. That was the harshest winter of the Siege of Leningrad. Most of the people died during this time. Now, as I already said, this was a siege. This was the Siege of Leningrad after all. So the people didn't have enough food to eat. And the only food that they had available was basically bread. And in the beginning, each person could get 200, and, no, 500 grams of bread a day, each person. Each factory worker, I believe, each soldier could get 500 grams a day. For children, it was 300. Every month, those rations shrank. In the end, every factory worker and every soldier got 75 grams of bread per day. 75. Can you imagine how little 75 grams is? And every child got 30 grams of bread. The city. People, people in the city were dying in the streets. They, they, did it, they tried to walk around, they tried to find something to eat. All the pigeons were eating, all the cats were eating, all the dogs were eating. There was nothing left. So people would walk out and would die in the streets. And here are some images to illustrate this. So the first image that you see on the very far left, that is one of the most famous images of the Siege of Leningrad. It shows a, it shows a patrol. There was there were special patrols in Leningrad which were supposed to clean up the dead bodies on the street. People who died. So that is a that is a dead body on a sled. The second image is the situation by by December of 1941. The the uh, the lines the border show there they did not move for almost two and a half years. The people who defended Leningrad did not let anybody get closer to their city. They did, not let, they did not let anybody take their city. And the last image over there shows people trying to clear the street after an artillery bombardment. Now, I want to talk about artillery bombardments, especially because this was the first time in World War II when the German army got I believe around 2,000 artillery assets to gather around the city and to fire every day. They did not count how much ammo they wasted. They did not count how many shells were wasted. Their objective was to destroy the city completely to the ground. And the effects were very, they were very strong. The road of life. Uh, the road of life is. This is one of the most famous aspects of the Siege of Leningrad because the road of life was the road of life. It was, it was the only transport line where supplies could be brought to the city. And it ran across a river, the Neva River, which is, a, which is in Leningrad. And when the river froze over, the trucks would drive over. There were, uh, Gas uh, 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 trucks, they were the, the most famous trucks, I believe, in the Soviet Army, the most widespread. They were very heavy, those trucks, so every time when they would drive over the river, I believe, yes, you see that bottom foot over there? The doors are open. The doors would always be open so that the driver could get out. So, because just in case if the ice cracked, just in case if there was an artillery bombardment, just in case if there was an airplane coming in, the driver could always jump in power. The road was going two ways. The first, there were two big lanes. The first lane <coughs> sent supplies into the city. So trucks would bring in food, water. 
Yes, there was even a shortage of water in Leningrad, even though there's a lake there. And the other thing would bring out people from the city. Now, after the war, a lot of people, a lot of journalists, specifically in the West, said that the Soviet Union did not save its people in Leningrad. That is not true. The Soviet army and the Soviet government saved as much people as they could. The road was very narrow. So you can't get out all citizens of the city at the same time. And some didn't want to leave. Some wanted to defend their city till the last breath. Some didn't want to leave because they loved the city. It was their hometown. And they wanted to stay there. So around 400,000 people were evacuated in total with this road of life. And I believe many more thousands of people were saved with the food and with the hope that this road existed. And to say a little bit about the German tactics. A lot of Western scholars and a lot of Western historians said that the German army was very noble when they fought. No, they were not noble. Every time when the river Neva froze up, the Germans would send all the dive bombers that they had to bomb the ice so that it would break and so that the trucks would sink and so that the people would die. They did not care about the casualties of the people. We were, but don't mention it, we were people of a lower quality. We were second class people. And they treated us just like that. And these are all just photos of the trucks coming in and out of Leningrad, some carrying supplies, some carrying people. Attempts to break through. Here is a just a small correction. Yes. Uh, if I remember it right, uh, the road of life was not River Neva, it was Lake Ladoga. It was Ladoga and Neva. And Neva as well? Yes. It was. It was. You could say that it was a. We call it the road of life, but it was in multiple locations because there was no, there was no one big road which the people could follow, which the trucks could follow. So, attempts to break through. During 1941, there were three attempts to break through the defensive, to break through the German lines. Every time the Soviet command, I believe every two months, they would try to get up all the units that they had in this area and try to break through. Sadly, every time, these units failed. But, when they tried to break through, they saved the city of Leningrad from another artillery bombardment or from another German division that would come in and try to storm the city. They would take away some of the fire, some of the deaths that the Germans were causing. And some of these are photos. And the one on the top is a painting. It's an artist's rendition of the soldiers advancing towards the German lines, trying to break through. One of the one of the most interesting things is the soldiers during Leningrad were called the men with no fear, the soldiers with no fear. Why? Because these people, they really wanted to save the people who were in Leningrad. And every time there was an attack, they wouldn't turn back even if the casualties were high. They wanted to save the people of the city, so they would continue advancing. Even if it was suicide, they would just continue going on going on and going on. Sadly, their efforts failed. Until later. And the last photo that you see over here, this is the German tank. It's called the, it's called the Tiger tank. It's the most German, the most famous German tank, I believe, of oh, 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 World War II. It was a heavy tank. And the Germans decided to show how much Leningrad is important to them to show that they send their first tiger tanks towards Leningrad. They hope that maybe these tigers can take the city. It didn't work. And we captured, the Soviet army captured the first tiger in the battle under Leningrad. There were eight tanks that were advancing, eight tiger tanks. Seven of them were destroyed. One of them tried to get away, but got ironically, ironically. It got stuck because the ice broke under it, and it sank to the bottom of the river. 
we lifted it from the bottom of the river and we used it there. Spring of 1942, the turning point. Why did I call this the turning point? Because after the very harsh, the uh, inhumane winter of 1941, 1942, the spring of 1942 was one of the hottest springs ever recorded in history of, of that region specifically. It was very warm, and thanks to that, a lot of crops rose up, and people started to have hope because finally there was food. There was something that they could eat. And the people, the people did not, they, the people who were on the brink of death, with this new game to hope, they became unbreakable. They became absolute, absolutely unbreakable. The Germans would launch artillery barrages, cause bombings, they would send in their soldiers, but that wouldn't break them. At that point, there was a defensive line that were, the, the boundaries around Leningrad formed, which were never broken. No German soldier went over these lines, and I would like to tell you the story of how those boundaries were created. When the siege of Leningrad began, a group of priests of the Russian Orthodox Church wanted, decided to come to Stalin. And what they wanted to talk about was Leningrad, because Leningrad was a very important city. And they said that if you take the, the icon of the Holy Mother of Kazan and you fly around the city, the city will never be taken. And Stalin did that. Stalin got a plane. He got the, the Holy Mother of Kazan icon. And they flew around Leningrad. And the German troops never passed the borders, which were which were set by the airplane. And here are the photos that I wanted to show. The first photo is people getting water. Why did I want to talk about people getting water? Because water was very important in Leningrad too. There was a shortage of it during the winter. It's because the winter was so harsh. There was nothing to melt the ice with. Even the stoves that the people had, they had no, they had, they had nothing to power the stoves with. So sometimes the people would die because of dehydration. And to many people, a glass of water saved their life. Just a simple glass of water would save their life because they would go, oh, there is hope. If there is water, then there might be bread. If there is bread, then we can live. If we can live, that means that we can fight. If we can fight, that means that we can win. There will be a victory. And we will be successful. Another image is showing the water one with the trucks. That's again showing the road of life. I wanted to show this image because you can see how these trucks are actually driving in water. These trucks are driving in water, so there's a chance that any of them might collapse right now under the very thin ice that was under the water. This was interesting because, you know, you you usually don't have water above ice. But I don't know, maybe something happened during the winter. Maybe the ice was so thick it didn't want to melt away and the water had to go on top of the ice. But that's how it worked. And the top image is a little train. It's a little train which um, during the siege of Leningrad, they built railroad tra tracks around some of the big roads of the city so that, the, so that trains like this could bring food to the people. And I believe this is a, a lot of the trains is, I believe it's in the Museum of the History of Leningrad, in the Museum of the Blockade of Leningrad, and it's preserved there because it was, a, it was a, a lifestyle. The final nail into the blockade. Now, we'll have to advance a little bit, we'll have to fast forward a little bit in history because uh, if 1941, the winter of 1941, 1942 was the harshest, spring of 1942 was better, and after that, life kept getting better and better because the climate was getting nicer 
and because the people were having new hope. And I personally find this amazing because during those two and a half years, it was the same people that kept fighting. And the same people managed to get everything better and better. And I believe that this is unbelievable. It's a miracle. Because these people are absolutely tired. They're surrounded. They're actually cut off from the rest of the world. They were cut off on the 8th of September, 1941, when the Germans cut all telephone and telegraph lines. And these people are prospering. These people are surviving. And finally, in 1943, in December of 1943, there was a very little, but very successful battle in which our Soviet soldiers finally broke through the German lines. It was a celebration, but the blockade was still not over. So then, the Stalin gave the order to every unit that was available in Leningrad to get together and to break through that little, little piece of land that was free, that was free for passage, and to finally liberate Leningrad. And it worked. On the 27th of January, 1944, Leningrad was de-sieged. It was deblocated. It was freed. It was, it was a Soviet city again. It was connected to the world again. And here are some images that show the Soviet soldiers, and again, two paintings, showing the Soviet soldiers advancing towards Leningrad. So, that is a that is a train. So uh, during the war, this was a very some call it a strange custom because 20 years before that, during the Russian Civil War, uh, military trains had guns placed on them, and they would just ride around the railroad tracks, uh, you know, kind of like mobile units, mobile tanks, you could say tanks on rails, they were called, and 20 years later, the same strategy was used to help to break through the siege of Leningrad. And this is interesting because everyone said that these tanks on rails were outdated on that moment. And the last image over here is, is part of a museum exposition. It's called Breakthrough, Rarif. It was opened in 2010, and it shows it shows how the Soviet army broke through to, Len to Leningrad, and it is, in my opinion, very interesting because they gathered some of the tanks that were destroyed during the battle, and they completely fixed them. And this tank that you see over here, this is a Bete tank, Bete Five. The BD-5 is a very rare tank nowadays, so to fix it, you need to get the ATF from somewhere. You would have to get the budget from somewhere. And these people were not supported by the government, by the way. This was a completely private enterprise. They decided to do it kind of like a surprise for another for another anniversary of the of the deblocation of Leningrad. This was the slide that I wanted to dedicate to the Our Lady of Kazan Miracle. So this is a Lidva plane. This was, this is not the photo of the plane, of the exact same plane that flew the icon around the city, but it is, uh, it is a photo of the airplane of the same type. That is Joseph Stalin, Yosef Yisrovich Stalin, the leader of the Soviet Union back then, and finally, the Our Lady of Kazan, the icon of Yes, this slide is dedicated to the very harsh facts of Leningrad's history because I can't talk about all of them. Some of them are too harsh. There's too many of them. The whole situation was completely inhumane. But the ones that I decided to talk about is, the first one is the diary entries of Tanya Savich. She was a girl in Leningrad who survived the. She didn't survive the siege. She 
she, uh, I'll, I'll talk about her a bit later. Tanya Savichiva was as popular in the Soviet Union for her diary entries as Anne Frank was in the West. And her diary entries are very simple, but they are, but they are very moving because they're written so simply. They're written by a little nine-year-old girl who has lost all of her family in a matter of two months. And I can't read them all. I, I can't read them all off because I would cry. I, I, I just can't. But just I, I just want to say that she loses all of her family in a matter of two months. And she herself, she was rescued from Lenin. She was she got into one of the trucks that was on the road of life, but Unfortunately, she died because of hunger. If a person is very hungry for a long time, if he's not fed, then if you give him good food right away, it is like poison to his or her body. And the person dies. That's exactly what happened to Tanya Savichina. But we remember her. That's her photo on the first image. The second image is it's part of a tribute to the Siege of Leningrad. It is, I showed you the train before, and this was this is one of the carriages that carried the that carried the food. But these carriages were also used for another thing. They were used to carry dead people, people who had died in the streets. So this is a it is both a savior and it is both a carriage that brought people to the to the to the crematorium to be burned. So it is a very a scary attribute of war. And the last image is just an image of uh, over here. I don't think that everyone can see what's written on the wall, but I'll first say it in Russian and then I'll translate it to English. Which means citizens. During bombing, this side of the road is dangerous. Now, this phrase became a symbol of the siege of Leningrad because they were everywhere around the city when the bombing had begun. People would find the last remains of paint that they have and would paint them on the wall to save the others. And when my father was in Leningrad, he saw one of the old buildings, he told me about it, which was almost completely demolished. But well, on it was written the exact same phrase. And then when I was in, in, well, in St. Petersburg, I saw a building too. It was far away in the distance, but I saw the remains. The phrase itself, some of it was erased, you know, eradicated through time because of rain and other conditions, but I saw it. And I felt like history was reaching out to me. You know, an old, a small remain of the old times of this heroic. And, again, Leningrad, even though it was surrounded, they said that people were absolutely wonderful people. Even during the siege, even though there were bombings every day, some of them loved music. Some of them loved the opera. And so, at one point of time, uh, one of the most famous composers of all time, Dmitry Shostakovich, visited Leningrad. And he stayed there for a couple of months. He was part of the, one of the patrols that helped clean the streets away from dead people. And he was very moved by this. He was very moved. And he wrote his most, I wouldn't say that it's his most famous piece, but one of his most famous pieces, the Seventh Symp Symphony, while in Leningrad. And it was first performed there. He didn't conduct the orchestra himself when he was there, but uh, the symphony was played in, I believe, the biggest opera house in Leningrad, and the people went to see it. And the music was retranslated to the German soldiers who were advancing. And our people were completely moved by this, because music, during a siege, during war, it's, it's something heavenly, almost heavenly, because it doesn't fit in. It's so beautiful. I've listened to the Seventh Symphony myself. 
is very powerful, very strong. And when I created this presentation, I was listening to it to try to understand how the people felt when they heard it. And the German soldiers who heard it, they were terrified. They couldn't believe that people who were in the city were listening to music. They couldn't believe that there was an orchestra. And this is a photo of the first performance in Leningrad. They couldn't believe that people were playing music when they had no food, no shelter. They were listening to music. And two German soldiers found the conductor, uh, I believe his name is Edelstein. They found him after the war and they said, that's when we understood that we lost the war. You people in the city that was surrounded by us, we were listening to music. And we, we tried to do everything to destroy you, but we didn't succeed. And here's a story, just a little story about the conductor. They, well, before a performance, you know, you have to get, some conductors get themselves in shape, they clean everything, they polish everything. Now, the, the, the conductor, needed to polish his shirt before the concert, but there was nothing to polish it with. And the people got two pieces of, two potatoes. They crushed them, and they got that specific thing that was needed to polish the shirt. They gave up their food to just listen to music. I believe it was shown later in a movie. Can you believe it? Can you believe us giving away our only food, those two little potatoes, so that the conductor can perform beautiful music that we can listen to? Yes, and this is the battle that I wanted to talk about. Now, this man over here is Dino Nikolaev. He was a tank man. He was a Soviet tank man during World War II. He, he is a true hero because during one battle, he destroyed 22 German tanks. Now, he didn't do it by himself. There were five people who were in the KV-1 tank. Remember the very powerful tanks that I told you about? He was the commander of one of these KV-1 tanks, and in half an hour, they destroyed 22 tanks. And these 22 tanks formed one German tank division, the first tank division. And the Germans were terrified when they had sent a division to advance forward. And in half an hour, it disappeared. It just vanished, evaporated from the face of the earth. And this is a map of the battle. Again, it's in Russian. Sorry. It's this. Uh, this battle wasn't even famous in the Soviet Union. When Kolobanov told it to his comrades, I believe 40 years, uh, in 1985, he worked at a factory and he decided to tell the story to the others who were there. They laughed. They couldn't believe him. They told him, what are you, drunk? It's impossible. And Kolobanov, after the battle, he was, he was supposed to get the hero of the Soviet Union battle, but he never got it. None of the people who were in his tank were awarded anything. They were just forgotten about. But after, I believe, after he died, the, I think it was, I think it was during the, the 2000s already, Putin decided to give him the title of the hero of the Russian Federation post honestly and to award the members, the people who were in the tank, the hero, what was the hero? I, a very high honor too. And this was a, this is a picture of the KV-1 tank after the battle. There were 156 scars on the tank. No German tank penetrated. None. The tank was absolutely intact after the battle ended. And just to tell you a little bit more, Kolobanov was actually commander of a whole tank squad, so there were five tanks, and while he, 
his tank destroyed 22 tanks. The others were fighting on that day too. In total, these five tanks of Kolobanov destroyed 43 German tanks in one day, stopping the German advance towards Leningrad. This was in 1941, so on the 8th of August 1941. They stopped the German advance towards Leningrad for two weeks completely. And I decided to end this very harsh presentation on a more happier note. These are images of Leningrad after it was deblockaded. The salute in the streets. But to show that the people had survived and persevered through these 872 days of the siege of Leningrad. Thank you very much for listening. that this was a delicacy. Soup made out of glue. And another thing is that during Perestroika, this was the 1980s of the Soviet Union, there was uh, a very popular theme was that the, Soviet, that the Soviet leaders, the party leaders of the party organization of Leningrad were not hungry during the blockade. And their main evidence was the journal of one of the, one of the, leader, of the party leaders of Leningrad, and in it, in it is written that, oh, I, ate, I drank some white wine and some red wine and I ate some turkey. Recently, it was found out that this person was mentally insane when he was writing in the journal. So when he was talking about that he was eating food, he was imagining it. And one of the leaders, of the, one of the party leaders of the party organization of Leningrad, Alexei Kuznetsov, he was the first secretary of the Leningrad Party Organization. His son died of destruction. Basically, he didn't have any food or anything to eat, so he died during the battle. Everyone suffered. Everyone did what they could to defend the state. Thank you very much. How many of them were taken out to Germany, and so we don't have that room. I don't know how to say it in English. Yantarna. It hasn't been restored. Never found. So that was some, one of the coins as well. Yes, and not to mention how quickly it was restored. All those museums were restored after the war, like within three, four, five years maximum. So it's, yeah, it's astonishing. In fact, that's that. Thank you very much because it's a something that we have to remember. But sometimes with all those routines, we, you know, it makes not, all, not only proud that what show people how all together we can get, you know, we can just to be a very strong family. And unfortunately, we, we keep on forgetting about it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to share a small episode. I was in St. Petersburg only once in my life, and I was only 18 years old. Uh, with my girlfriend, and we were young, and, and that. so we got, uh, we met two like guys in St. Petersburg, and <laughs> in sitting in the cafe, and they said, by the way, girl, do you want to go to Philharmonia? I said, okay, why not? 
So we came to this concert very like well. But you know it was Shostakovich, his symphony devoted to blockage of Denver. And I remember how we were we were turned upside down and inside out, how moving it was. And I still up to this moment I remember this feeling. And especially like this this whole philharmonium in St. Peter's, it's unbelievable acoustic. And it was so serious and it was so moving that so there was a there was a discussion by some of the more more Western, more liberal political leaders that we should have given up Leningrad. And that's absolutely wrong because the people who were in Leningrad, the already besieged people. Every single one of them would have been executed. That was the German plan to execute everybody. Destroy, destroy everything, yes, destroy the city. And no, that is absolutely wrong. You can't give up a city that is so important to our culture. St. Petersburg was the capital of the Russian Empire. It is, then it, when, it, when it became Leningrad, it was the cultural, you could say that it was kind of the cultural capital of the Soviet Union. And it was the heart of the culture of the Soviet Union. And giving that up, no, we can't do that. That is too great of a price to pay for nothing. 